sometimes I still have nightmares of things that had happened, such as my siblings being chained up or getting beaten. You are about to hear one of the most horrifying stories of child abuse ever told. A severely skinny 17-year-old girl. Over the past two years, she'd been planning to leave her family home. So, grabbing a deactivated phone she'd hidden for months in one hand. With the other hand, she grabbed the handle and slipped out, trying to be as quiet as she could. Seeing what just happened, her sister thinks it's a dream. In fact, this was a once-in-a-lifetime chance she didn't want to miss. So after her older sister, she went through the window. Together, they stood among the weeds that grew rampant, smothering the withered grass. One of the girls started walking across the lawn, away from the house where she had been confined for so long, while her younger sister stood there in the dark, shivering. And at this point, she knew she had to go back. Too scared, she climbed back into the house back through the window they had just escaped through. So now, the older hero had to deal with it. And the first thing she did while shaking violently, she dialed 911. 911, state your emergency? No, oh yes, I'm still here. What's your name? Gordon Turpin. Okay, I live in a family of 15 people, and my parents are abusing, they abuse us, and my two little sisters right now are chained up. There's... 13 kids, and then a mother and father. And how many of your siblings are tied up? Two of my sisters, one of my brothers. How are they tied up, with rope or with what? With chains. They're chained up to their bed. I've never been out. I don't go out much, so I don't know anything about the streets or anything. Does anybody at the house take any kind of medication? Oh, uh, I don't know what medication is. Are you homeschooled? No, we don't. Do school. Our mother tells people we'll homeschool. Our mother tells people we'll private school, and she has a fake private school set up. But we don't really do school. I haven't finished first grade, and I'm 17. I don't know much about my mother. She doesn't like us. She doesn't spend time with us ever. Hi. Is that the deputy? Um. Yes. Go talk to him. Okay. There are few stories as chilling as the Turpin family. You remember this story ruling national and international news in January 2018. A staged photo of a big, happy family on every screen. There's one that stands out to me, the Turpin parents renew their vows at a chapel in Las Vegas, surrounded by their 13 kids, who are all dressed in purple plaid dresses and white tights, and the three boys in suits and purple ties. Everyone was smiling ear to ear. And yet, there's something strange about the family photo. Still, you don't quite know what it is. It turns out David and Louise Turpin were trying to convey a certain feeling in those photos. But in reality, it couldn't have been further from the truth. These photos actually confirmed what we had felt from the big family picture. That there was something off about their home in Southern California. It was all a charade, to hide how depraved humans can be. Betty and James Turpin raised David Allen Turpin in Princeton, West Virginia. He had a very religious family, but little information about his early life. Also, his childhood was relatively normal. In Princeton High School, David participated in numerous extracurricular activities, such as chess and Bible club. After graduating high school, David studied electrical engineering at Virginia Tech University. In fact, it was not surprising that David ended up working at Northrop Grumman and Lockheed Martin because he was highly gifted in his field. David was a very religious man too, who never missed a Sunday. There, he met the beautiful Louise. In the weeks that followed, David kept seeing Louise until he decided he had to date her in secret since she was 15 and he was 22, which technically made him a pedophile. Louise was the oldest child of Phyllis and Wayne Robinette in Princeton, West Virginia and was born in May 1968. The parents were evangelical Christians, Wayne was a preacher, and Phyllis worked at Walmart as a cashier. Phyllis and Wayne fought a lot and were strict and unforgiving with their kids. From a very young age, Louise, her sisters, 
and her mother was sexually abused by a relative, and that sexual abuse was a big secret in Louise's family, always present but never spoken about. I guess it's fair to say the Robinette kids had a tough childhood. Despite her harsh life, Louise was loving, soft-spoken, and sweet, trying to calm them after their parents had explosive arguments and shielding them from their predatory relative. At this point, Louise's parents didn't know about their relationship because they were worried about Louise's reactions. But Phyllis would discover the relationship who accepted it because David was a good Christian and she trusted Louise, yet they kept it a secret from Wayne. As time went on the father would learn about their relationship and eventually agree to their marriage after running away together several times. Eventually, the two got married just across the border in Parisburg, Virginia, in February 1985. During the early days of their marriage, the Turpins actually did well. But soon after they got married, Louise cut off all ties with her family. She decided to embrace her newfound freedom, no longer constrained by her strict parents. That got worse when she gave birth to their first kid. Around 18 months later, in 1990, David moved Louise and their baby to Fort Worth after being transferred by Lockheed Martin. They moved into a really nice house in Meadow Creek. Louise invited her family in West Virginia to come to visit her shortly after she moved. And that's when Louise's parents realized David was making good money and had a pretty good life. Louise's family didn't have much money growing up. She must have wanted her mother and siblings to see how well she was doing. So she and David paid for their flights, too. Louise and David welcomed another child into the world the following year, in 1991. It was a second son. From the outside looking in, it didn't appear that things were getting worse for the Turpins. They seemed like a happy little family. However, that was the year David and Louise filed for Chapter 7 bankruptcy. They were in a lot of debt despite David's six-figure salary. Despite their money woes, they lived a luxurious lifestyle they couldn't afford. And they never thought twice about having more kids, in 1993, Louise got pregnant with their third child. Since David and Louise moved to Fort Worth, Louise's family visited every year. At this point, they were determined no one would find out that they were struggling financially, so they again paid for everything during their trip. Teresa, Louise's sister, later said that they had no clue anything was wrong with her sister during that trip. Turpin's oldest daughter, born in 1988, started school in Meadow Creek Elementary in 1994. She wore the same dirty clothes every day, her hair was unbrushed and greasy, and she wasn't bathing regularly. Her classmates teased her and made fun of her for her bad hygiene. In 1995, Louise and David's fourth child, another boy, was born. The following year, the family of six traveled to West Virginia to see Louise, as usual, they paid for their trip and treated them to fancy food every day. In 1996, Louise's sister Elizabeth returned to Fort Worth with the Turpins to spend the summer with them. While on the way back, they stopped at a casino in Louisiana. As Louise and David went in to gamble, Elizabeth asked if she could watch the kids. Elizabeth was dumbfounded. This wasn't the Louise she knew. Growing up, they were taught that gambling was sinful. When David and Louise got back from the casino trip, they got into a big argument where David said Louise had a gambling problem and lost all her money. When Elizabeth visited, she understood that the Turpins didn't really live the way they were portraying it to be. Louise and David were extremely controlling of their children not letting them go to the bathroom, eat, or drink without their permission. She also didn't see any affection between David or Louise towards the children the whole time she was there. And on top of all that, David would often watch Elizabeth while she was showering. The way Elizabeth handled it, despite how creepy and perverted it was, sounded like she just laughed it off. I do not believe Elizabeth ever went back to stay with Louise and her family after that visit. Louise and David welcomed their fifth child in May 1997. The following September, when their oldest daughter went back to school, her hygiene was even worse. Basically, she was talking about things that might indicate sexual abuse and was sent to the principal's office to clarify her situation, yet no action was taken to find out if there was abuse at the Turpin home. 
The sixth Turpin kid, another girl, was born in 1998. As time went on, David and Louise continued to frequent casinos regularly. The couple's finances were a disaster, even with David's highly paid job. So the oldest daughter, who was 10 at the time, stopped going to school. As for the other four children, none of them attended school. After the bank foreclosed on their Fort Worth home in 1998, the family moved out around this time. When they left, the house was in disgusting shape. They obviously wanted it that way for the new owners. The new owners thought there was excrement on the walls because of the smell, dirt, and stains on the walls. In 1999, Louise gave birth to the seventh Turpin. In Rio Vista, the Turpins had five more children between 2001 and 2007. There are now a total of 12 children. Although the children were clearly neglected in Fort Worth, it is unclear whether they were physically or emotionally abused, and if so, how severe that abuse was. In Rio Vista in 1999, however, the abuse got worse. Children were slapped, choked, and whipped with belts for doing stuff like going to the bathroom without asking. They weren't allowed to shower or bathe more than once a year, and they were fed cheap frozen food and bologna sandwiches. When David and Louise bought food that looked delicious, like pies and fresh bread, they wouldn't let their kids eat it. While they starved, they'd make them sit and just look at the food. Children were malnourished, which stunted their growth and left them sallow and pasty. It made them look younger than they were. Lack of socialization outside the home and psychological abuse slowed cognitive development. Her family stopped visiting when they moved to Rio Vista. Now they talk on Skype. While the Turpins lived in Rio Vista, police checked on them twice, but never for reports of abuse or neglect. The first time was when the four-year-old daughter of Turpin was bitten by a dog in June 2001. The second time was in February 2003, when Turpin's pet pig escaped from the yard and ate 55 pounds of dog food. My head spins and I have no idea why they kept a pig, with the kids in the house. In 2004, a mobile home with an expensive look appeared on the Rio Vista property. David, Louise and the 10 kids abandoned the house and moved into the trailer, don't ask me how they all fit in there, since the house was uninhabitable. It was filled with garbage, dead rats, and who knows what else. By this point, I'm sure the children were all sick from living in such disgusting conditions. When Louise was 40, she had an interesting talk with her sister Teresa, where she told her about the wild things she and David had been up to. Teresa told her they weren't going to church anymore, which was liberating because it gave her the freedom to explore different spiritual practices. It was a big deal for them to stop going to church after growing up in such devout Christian homes. Teresa also learned that Louise and David were swinging. Leaving the older children at home to care for the younger ones, they would go meet strangers they met online for sex. Louise was the only one having sex outside their marriage, but David didn't mind. Apparently, he was more than happy to facilitate his wife's hookups, driving her to places to meet men and waiting until she was done. This was the first time Teresa had ever been so shocked. As Teresa searched for a way to explain what had happened to her once nurturing, caring sister, she could not do so. As of 2010, the Turpins moved to Marietta, which is in southwestern Riverside County. Louise's family stopped talking with her over Skype. Her sisters plea Louise's sisters begged her to just let them call the kids for a minute, but she either ignored them or told them they were too busy. They indeed were hurt and upset, but they weren't able to do much. In 2011, David Turpin opened a private school from his Marietta home, called Sandcastle Day School. He listed himself as the principal and administrator of the school, which had six students enrolled in different grades. The only thing he had to do was fill out an affidavit from the Department of Education stating that the kids were enrolled full-time, but private schools do not fall under the control of the Education Department. The state did not have the authority to inspect the school as they would have with regular schools. Anyhow, that fake school wouldn't last more than four years. When the Turpins made their last move, in 2014, they moved to Paris, about 20 miles north of Marietta. At this point, 
the abuse had gone out of control. There was a lot more violence between David and Louise Turpin and the children than they had ever been. And if they tried to escape the horror scene, chains and locks would replace the ropes. They'd be in their rooms up to 20 hours a day. The air was so stagnant and so foul-smelling that they didn't feel like breathing anymore. As things continue to deteriorate, things are only going to get worse. In 2015, Louise gave birth to her 13th child. Around the same time, the kids had been going through nightmares. Once a day they would have a peanut butter sandwich for their meals, and the only thing they could eat was peanut butter. They were living in cages just like squirrels. And sadly, none of them was able to escape the abuse and punishments they were subjected to both in and outside of the cages. It was only the two-year-old who was not malnourished or abused. You could hardly imagine how they managed to survive. It was only God's plan to rescue them when he gave that dedication to that 17-year-old, who secretly used to post videos on YouTube showing their mystery. By leaving the house of horrors, she planned to get help for herself and her siblings. Luckily, she found it very quickly. In short, when the police arrived on the scene, the girl told them about the photographs she had taken of the inside of the house they are now standing next to. So officers knocked on the door, and Louise Turpin answered it in panic. On entering the home, an unpleasant odor quickly hit them. The odor worsened as they progressed through the house. It was truly horrible inside that house. And just like the girl said, her siblings were chained to their beds. All of them were so small and sickly that the officers could not believe that seven of them were adults. The floors were covered in grime and garbage. Since the children had been chained to their beds, they had obviously not been able to use the bathroom. All 13 kids were removed from the home by police. Six minors were taken to Riverside University Medical Center in Moreno Valley and seven adults to Corona Regional Medical Center. I do not know how awful these people are. I can't describe my feelings towards them. Louise and David Turpin were arrested on suspicion of child abuse and torture on January 14, 2018. Four days later, they were accused of torture, abuse of a dependent adult, child abuse slash neglect, and false imprisonment. Turpin was charged with one count of a lewd act on a child under 14. On January 24, 2018, Riverside County Superior Court Judge Emma Smith ordered David and Louise Turpin not to contact their children for three years. Lawyers are allowed to contact their children. In June 2018, the judge ruled that the evidence was sufficient to put David and Louise on trial. However, on February 22, 2019, both parents changed their pleas, pleading guilty to 14 counts of torture, abuse of a dependent adult, child endangerment and false imprisonment. In dark, filthy conditions, the kids were tied up with ropes. When they escaped, they were chained and padlocked. Most of the time they couldn't get to the bathroom because they were chained up. As far as physical abuse goes, there have been slaps, strangulations, and being thrown downstairs. When it came to showering, it was only permitted once every year. The kids were taunted with food they weren't allowed to eat, Despite the fact that they were routinely starved, the eldest daughter, aged 29, weighed just 82 pounds. Because of the prolonged physical abuse they had sustained, they had suffered from nerve damage. Some of them were cognitively impaired and lacked basic knowledge about life. They don't know the meaning of the word police officer. They also did not know what medicine was. The last time any one of them saw a doctor was more than four years ago. None of them had ever been to the dentist. Their parents bought toys, but they kept them in their packages. The kids couldn't play with them. They were made to stay up all night, not being allowed to go to bed, walking around in circles until dawn, until four or five in the morning. This isn't life. This is a nightmare. Hopefully they're doing well now. I cannot describe in words what we went through growing up. Sometimes I still have nightmares of things that had happened, such as my siblings 
being chained up or getting beaten. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> my parents took my whole life from me, but now I'm taking my life back. I'm in college now and living independently. I love hanging out with my friends and life is great. I believe everything happens for a reason. Life may have been bad, but it made me strong. I fought to become the person I am. I saw my dad change my mom. They almost changed me, but I realized what was happening. I immediately did what I could to not become like that. I'm a fighter, I'm strong, and I'm shooting through life like a rocket. <laughs> Today, um, I will be starting with Jessica's um, statement. Master's sister. Correct. I love both of my parents so much. Although it may not have been the best way of raising us, I am glad that they did, because it made me the person I am today. I just want to thank them for teaching me about God and faith. I hope that they never lose their faith. God looks at the heart and I... And I know he sees theirs. Sorry. I never intended for any harm to come to my children. I'm sorry if I've done anything to cause them harm. In 2036, Louise will be 67 years of age and eligible for parole. She is currently being held at Central California Women's Facility in Chowchilla. In 2036, when David Turpin is 74 years old, he will be eligible for parole. He is in California State Prison in Corcoran. <laughs>